again for joining me here at Burt's Books where this time we are going to be looking at the quartet of novels that were produced between 1977 and 1981 which followed the plot curve of the BBC's highly successful drama series Secret Army or as I like to think of them the Kessler Quadrilogy. They're a dramatised account of the wartime exploits of a Belgian resistance escape line, conceived by former RAF man Gerard Glaister, with John Brayson, uh, the author of all these titles, on board as the script editor. The Secret Army followed on the heels of the highly successful Cold It series, which Glaister and Brayson had also worked on. Colditz had set a high quality precedent as an intelligent wartime based drama series whose plot lines were rooted in real world events, didn't shy away from moral ambiguities and which treated the subject with a certain level of even handedness. This same approach was largely maintained for this subsequent project, for which Glaister was able to draw on his own wartime experiences, and which also featured certain cast members from Colditz, including Bernard Hepton, who'd been the Commandant, and Christopher Neem. You'd expect the first book in this series, which was published the same year that the first TV series was aired, 1977, uh, to be a straight transfer of the chief storylines from that first series. But that's not the case. The first novel, and I think this is quite a clever touch, is a prequel to the first TV series. Taking the outbreak of war in 1939 as its starting point, uh, Brayson's book traces the movement of the key characters from the first series, their involvements with and their reactions to the events between then and 1942, manoeuvring the main players into the positions that we're going to find them at at the beginning of the TV show. So we're witness to Brussels restauranter Albert Foire eyeing up the premises that he aims to transform into the Candide. And we're party to the heartbreakingly traumatic experiences during Germany's invasion of 1940, which convince the young Lisa Colbert that her life's calling has to be the clandestine smuggling of downed RAF personnel through occupied territories to a neutral country from where they can eventually return to Britain. We follow the path of one of these downed airmen, flying officer John Kirk who's already familiar with the country and the language through his pre-war experiences, connecting with Lisa, who by now is codename Yvette, and her budding network in order to scoot over the Pyrenees before his eventual return to Belgium as an undercover British operative, perhaps influenced by the fact that he's fallen in love with Yvette. We get to meet the disenchanted Luftwaffe officer Evan Brandt, who's been discharged from flying duties and transferred to a desk job in Brussels, where he's to coordinate his efforts. The SD officer Gundel, a comparative sympathetic character given his position, foiling the attempts of networks such as Yvette's. We don't see a lot for a large chunk of this novel of the series' principal villain, the punctilious and cold-hearted Gestapo man in the glinty rimless spectacles, Ludwig Kessler, no relation to Leo, incidentally, who was so consummately played in the series by Clifford Rose. We get a very short glimpse of Kessler early on in the novel. He's getting a taste for the life in the Upper Silesian radio station raid in 1939. From here on, he's out of view until fairly late in the story, by which time Gundel, who we very briefly get to meet in the first TV series, whose success rate in Brussels isn't quite up to par, is bumped into a frontline job. Kessler, who's considered to be a rising star within the murky ranks of the security services, is considered the man to take over the job. Which is going to be an unpleasant surprise for the people of Brussels, and also for Herr Brandt, evidently. We're treated to a close-up of Kessler as he waits for an appointment with his enigmatic ally come adversary Admiral Canaris of the Abwehr. His bland, expressionless face, his fastidious nature, his fucking weirdness. In the classic manner of sinister men, he's sitting in a park bench, staring at a bunch of school kids at this point. It's ambiguous quite why. His skin pale, his hair neither quite blonde nor quite silver. There was something of the albino about him. Someone without colour. He breaks away, thankfully. Um, there's no further reference in the books or the series to this kitty staring thing so to get to his meeting with canaris the conclusion of which is that he probably can't expect a lot of help from the abwehr brussels would require molding and reshaping and kessler's would be the hands that would do just that Book one ends with Curtis and fellow escapees successfully delivered into Spain, um, turning back to view Yvette's disappearing figure and marvelling at the sacrifice and the risk that herself and fellow Belgians have made on their behalf. 
Book 2, Secret Army Dossier, published in 1978, compiles key episodes from both Series 1 and 2. In that respect, a series novelisation is sometimes the opposite of a, of a film one, in that you're obliged to edit your story down rather than to embellish it. These were long series, they were between 13 and 16 episodes each, and this book narrows two series down to just six stories. The opening story, Good Friday, which is from quite late in Series 1, uh, gives a good distillation of both sides' working realities. Opening up at the Condide, where SOE officer Curtis is paying a visit, Albert's mistress, Monique, is seething at the continued influence of Monsieur Foiré's bedbound wife. A father, Dom Girard, shows up, ostensibly to take André Foiré's confession, but there's an ulterior purpose to his visit. He's frequently given his assistance to the Lifeline escape line in the past, and today he's to do so again in taking in a British airman for the night before he can be moved to a safe house. Naturally, this represents a great compromise to the safety of the other members of Girard's Brotherhood, and which causes conflict within their priory, which culminates in Brother Anselm dropping a dime to the authorities on this matter. In the meantime, Lifeline are alerted to the likelihood that they're being trailed by a local collaborator, news which prompts Albert into a cold, surgical removal of his fellow countrymen, thus depriving Kessler and Brandt, whose uh, volatile working relationship as opposites, ostensibly working towards the same goal is clearly evident, uh, depriving them of a valuable informant. Kessler's methods we see in more detail as he and his troops descend upon the Priory. They perform a cruel mock execution of a couple of monks, prompting their informant brother Anselm to blow his own cover in front of his brothers. Kessler then hands back these would-be victims to Don Pierre, the senior of the Brotherhood, before attempting to use Girard as a bargaining chip to squeeze information out of Pierre, of which he has none to give. As they're being led away to captivity, a sudden move on Girard's part provokes a burst of gunfire, which cuts down both himself and captive Flight Lieutenant Oliver. While some of Kessler's men are visibly uncomfortable at what's going on, he himself shows no sign of it and only departs after forcing a biblical triple denial from Dom Pierre on any knowledge of resistance activities. As Brother Anselm faces a life of penance for his act, the chapter closes on the reflection that there's been a betrayal, a denial and an execution in the lead-up to Easter under the Nazi occupation. The dynamic of how the various opposing forces, namely Kessler's office, Lifeline's operation and the rival resistance operations who don't always work in harmony operate is fleshed out over the subsequent stories. Choice extracts from the two series. At some point in which Lifeline's originator Lisa Colbert is killed in an RAF raid unwittingly at the hands of the very people she's repeatedly risked her life to help. Book two culminates in Day of Wrath which is a dramatic adaptation of the real life story of uh, Flight Lieutenant Baron Jean de Silly's Longchamp's attack on the Brussels Gestapo headquarters in 1943, in which the exiled Belgian RAF man went off script during an operation and took matters into his own hands, receiving both a demotion and subsequently the Distinguished Flying Cross for his troubles. Book 3, Secret Army End of the Line, covers the third and final Secret Army series, from the summer to the autumn of 1944, a time in which Germany's foothold in Belgium begins to look shaky before being lost altogether. Between this and the previous book, a combination of Brandt's story arc is unfortunately lost. Brandt is implicated in the July plot against Hitler, and with a court-martial looming commits suicide. Central to Series 3's plotline is the deeply fractious relationship that plays out between Kessler and Brandt's replacement, another grounded Luftwaffe officer, this time a known flying ace, Major Reinhardt. If anything more of a realist than Brandt had been, and highly adept at baiting Kessler for maintaining his myopic fanaticism in the face of Germany's impending defeat. Along with the factional discord among Belgium's disparate resistance groups as the power vacuum opens up with the German forces' eventual departure. Albert, for much of this series, finds himself incarcerated on a murder charge for the death of his wife André, who has actually died of accidental causes in series two, on a tip-off from vengeful communist partisans, for whom Albert's apparent cosiness with the occupiers he's been hiding in plain sight as a popular restaurateur has marked him out as a collaborator. Lifeline, meanwhile, can no longer use their customary routes once the Allied invasion breaks out from Normandy, so have adopted the tactic of hiding the airmen out in the countryside until the Allied advance 
France can reach them. As the German situation in Brussels finally becomes untenable, Kessler fixes up a car in which to whisk himself and his Belgian involvement, Madeleine Duclos, out of harm's way, uh, but not before a final flare-up with Reinhardt, who informs Kessler that he's identified Albert Foiré of the Candide as the lifeline organiser. Rather than obey Kessler's orders and evacuate, he's heading off to the Candide for a final confrontation. Kessler's parting order to execute Monsieur Foiré falls on deaf ears, and instead Reinhardt hands over his pistol to Albert and declares himself Lifeline's prisoner. Kessler, meanwhile, doesn't get far before running out of fuel and having survived a strafing attack, he lifts a uniform and the papers from another of the RAF's victims, a captain of artillery, and sets off on foot with Madeleine. However, he's soon flushed out by an infantry patrol who've taken to whistling the tune of Lily Marlena on the march as a device for flushing out unsuspecting German fugitives. Kessler, under his assumed identity, informs the patrol that Madeline had merely been his hostage and heads off into captivity, nobody suspecting that he's anything other than a regular army officer. Albert narrowly escapes a summary execution at the hands of the Belgian Communist Brigade, and Monique is similarly rescued from a collaborator's fate via mob justice. Uh, however, their relationship does not survive all this. Monique is whisked off on a whirlwind romance with the British officer who's rescued her. As the war nears its conclusion, the series climaxes with Kessler's last act as a serving officer, albeit one under a false identity. And naturally, this is an unpleasant one. In an internment camp outside Brussels, where they're both incarcerated, Kessler engineers Reinhardt's downfall. Enabled either by an obscure paragraph in military code or the misguided atmosphere of chumminess between occupying forces and the surrendering German command structure, the Wehrmacht has somehow retained authority to internally carry out disciplinary acts, even those of a capital nature. Reinhardt is formally pulled up on failing to carry out Kessler's order to execute Albert. He's found guilty and the Allied authorities permit his execution at German hands. It sounds extraordinary, but this storyline, like apparently all in this third series, was based on a real incident in a camp in Schellingwude a few days after the war ended, in which two Kriegsmarine deserters, uh, Bruno Dorfer and Rainer Beck, received exactly this treatment, later dramatised in the 1969 film Fifth Day of Peace. Reinhardt's last words, spoken as if to a generation of his contemporaries, you're mad, all of you, stark raving mad. Madeleine, meanwhile, has fixed up some forged IDs both for herself and the loathsome Ludwig, ironically with Lifeline and Natalie's unsuspecting assistance, and having bribed the guards at the camp to look the other way for an inconsequential captain of artillery, she whisks Kessler to freedom, and the most hated man in Brussels swiftly disappears from view. The book doesn't touch on the mysterious lost episode, What Did You Do in the War, Daddy?, which was recorded but unaired, it concerned a 1969 reunion for a Belgian TV show between the Lifeline operatives. According to some accounts, this was pulled due to John Brayson's pronounced anti-communist leaning showing through too far, which is one aspect in which the series even-handedness falls down, rather. While there are sympathetic German characters we get to know, understand a little, and even like, as far as Belgium's communist resistance factions go, they're depicted throughout as a pretty irredeemable bunch. Possibly this reflects the fragmented nature of Belgian resistance movements during the war, but I can't imagine any veterans of the Front de l'Independence would have been thrilled by this episode. This episode is out there if you're curious. I would say the tone of it is rather jarring on various levels. It's a little bit like watching that Star Wars Christmas special, if you're familiar with that. It, it doesn't really work. However, the broad premise of this missing episode, um, which is the resurfacing of Kessler into public view under his assumed identity of German industrialist Manfred Dorf and his exposure on a Belgian current affairs show, this is reprised in a subsequent spin-off series, 1981's Kessler. Set as a contemporary drama, it begins with the by now fairly aged Lifeline members, uh, BBC props and makeup pull this off pretty well, reconvene for the current affairs TV show, they played the interview footage of Dwarf denying his prior identity. Albert is curiously so what about the whole thing, but Monique and Natalie have no doubt that this is their former nemesis. Also on Kessler's tail is the West German intelligence man Richard Bauer, who's had his internal struggles with the inherited national guilt of a post-war generation and has picked up on Dorf's former identity. 
The narrative points out that Kessler is a relatively insignificant figure in the greater scheme of things, but his links to a shadowy network of more notorious escapees, along with a growing network of neo-Nazis, has aroused Richard Bauer's interest. Also, there's Mikhail Rack, a 20-something Israeli woman whose mother, originally a Brussels citizen, had been packed off to Dachau by Kessler. She'd survived the war, but her sanity had been permanently damaged by the experience. Kessler comes with an author's note that explains that the story wasn't part of the original Secret Army concept, but that Kessler's character had become so popular with the viewers, I'm not quite sure popular's the word, but that his survival had left an unresolved plot thread. In other words, the viewing audience wanted to see this guy get his. Brayson is uh, also emphatic about the level of research undertaken in this project, into the area of post-war escape routes, though this book was written at a time when Martin Borman was still widely rumoured to have survived the war. That's less the received thinking now. Having had his cover blown, Kessler, along with his blonde Brunhilde of a daughter, Ingrid, who's highly active in a neo-fascist cell, they fail to shake off the attentions of their various pursuers, even with the resources at their disposal, namely an affluent old boy's network of pensionable goose-steppers and a young a mob of heavies who are capable of quite considerable nastiness as Mikhail's travelling companion finds out. With his daughter and her fellow neo-boyfriend and Rookert in tow, Kessler dodges between his country retreat and London in an effort to shake off the attention before finally hightailing it out to Paraguay to hook up with an ageing bunch of degenerates heading up by Borman and including a demented Dr Mengele in their number. These sad, dislocated old criminals with their amassed wealth to which Kessler is a keyholder and their misty-eyed reminiscences of a toxic past bicker amongst themselves, fail to reach any sort of working agreement with Ingrid's would-be new order who have an avaricious eye on the old bod's cash. The fabric unravels fairly rapidly for this truncated Fourth Reich and after Ingrid and boyfriend are mistakenly killed by the heavies, Kessler cornered by Bauer and Mikhail and confronted with his own culpability and the hopelessness of his situation, takes the classic exit route, a self-administered bullet to the brain. So that's Kessler. It's admittedly a bit of an afterthought to the series, but it resolves the outstanding question of justice coming this character's way. There's obvious comparisons to the Odessa file to be drawn from it. You're probably not going to get much out of this one if you're not already a Secret Army convert. The series itself suffered a bit of a historical injustice in becoming overshadowed by one of its comedy spin-offs, the long-running Allo Allo, which was thematically heavily based on Secret Army's premise and even featured a couple of the same actors. While a highly successful series, it's hard to equate Allo Allo's stature as a comedy with its over-reliance on repetitive catchphrases and that of Secret Army as a drama. It's really a neglected treasure of the BBC drama vaults and very much worth your discovery or a revisit. It's also a worthwhile reminder of the incredible achievements of the Belgian resistance movements at that time. The Belgian escape lines, including Comet, on which a Secret Army was based, are credited with the exfiltration of around 5,000 Allied servicemen. Brayson's series of books overall do a pretty good job in encapsulating key storylines, but the standout really has to be the first novel, which effectively gives you a whole unfilmed literary series, this flagship television drama. Stay still! What is this large 